Hello and welcome to module 5 of the Introduction to Mentalisation Based Treatment. In the previous modules we were thinking about emotions and distress and understanding the purpose of them. We touched on how we have basic primary emotions that are inbuilt instinctive reaction patterns to various stimuli. So today we're going to focus on something called attachment, which is another instinctive action pattern which is inbuilt within us as mammals. Attachment refers to the kind of bonds we form with each other. And what we'll go on to describe is how secure or not we feel that other people are going to be consistently available to us and receptive to us when we're in need of their support. We think this is really useful for you to start to reflect on and consider in relation to your mental health, as we know that one of the things which has a significant impact on mental well-being is the quality of our relationships. So we think learning about our individual attachment patterns will be useful for us to predict how certain types of relationships or certain types of interactions are going to affect us. Our first attachment relationships are with um, parents or caregivers or other significant family, people that we've been around in our formative years. Now, these attachment relationships will later influence the patterns and quality of our relationships with others as we move through life, for good and for bad. Though it's important to emphasise here that whilst these patterns can get quite well established, particularly in certain contexts for us, it's important to emphasise that they're not completely fixed. So with some conscious work, on it, we can influence our attachments that we have in our adult relationships. Attachment is a phenomenon we find in all mammals and the purpose of it, again what here is we're thinking about that survival as a species, to protect our immature young against dangers and promote affectionate bonds between relatives. So in this sense like with the basic emotions, it's an inbuilt instinctive reaction pattern within us. So when a child experiences something uncomfortable, such as um, hunger or thirst, frustration or fear, we have this inbuilt instinct to turn towards our attachment figures with an expectation that they will respond to us in a way that soothes the discomfort and makes us comfortable again. And in the same way, the young have that inbuilt instinct to call out when in that discomfort. The attachment figure has an equally instinctive reaction to the signals of unease on the part of the child. So for example, when one hears a child crying, one has an instinctive response to attend or soothe the child. And that's a signal that the caregiver needs to respond to the child in some way. And I suppose this, this template for emotional interaction becomes the template for how we become emotionally regulated. So to be responded to, to be given food or, or something to drink, or to be reassured when we're, when we're fearful, or to be smiled at, leads to an establishment of an inner image of an attachment person that's associated in our mind with an experience of well-being or some experience of reward some discomfort is taken away and we feel comfortable again. And as that experience happens over and over through our early informative years, we can, as it were, internalise an image of this attachment figure. 
So that's whereby just the thought of them can be enough to calm ourselves. So this is the standard path towards emotional regulation. How we learn to soothe ourselves when emotionally distressed. However, um, before we've achieved that ability to regulate our emotions within the context of a sort of reasonable amount of emotional activation, so before we've achieved that developmental milestone, the experience of being separated from our attachment figures usually involves feelings of unease and fear. So if you recall, when if we went back to that basic emotions that, that we covered in previous modules, one of those was called separation anxiety and sadness. And that's what we're referring to here. That, that that's an inbuilt emotional reaction pattern to the experience of unease that we feel when separated from our caregivers or significant others. So just to develop further this idea of a template um, through which we get our emotional needs met, so through which we, we take forward in our life as a way of getting support when we need it, we can start to think of the idea of these key attachment figures as what we might refer to as a secure base. So at times of unease or separation from our attachment figures, we have this inbuilt instinct, as it were, to seek out our secure base again and return to it and hopefully gain some reassurance from our attachment figures, the secure base, which then gives us the confidence to go out and explore the world a bit more. So you may have observed this with a parent and a young to toddler. So if you're out and about, perhaps on a train, and at first you might see the toddler, that they may um, sort of remain quite close to their parent. But as they start to gain confidence, they might get a bit bolder. So look at, a, look at some people, explore various things. They might move up and down the carriage. And then the train might pull in at another station and some people might get off as new people get on. And at that point, the situation has changed again. So it's become uncertain. So you might observe the toddler might seek out the parent again. So as the child might be feeling some unease or anxiety from being away from their secure base, they go back to their secure base. And then as things settle again, it starts over. So it's very much this notion of this secure base that we want to return to. When we feel unease or distress, discomfort, that's this inbuilt relation pattern that we have with ourselves. The problem for, is, for it is, it's a bit like the inbuilt emotions. So depending on our experiences, we can suppress or modify those inbuilt patterns. Because some of you might be thinking, I don't feel I have a secure base. I don't feel confident that people are going to be there for me. So I don't tend to reach out when I feel distressed. So these different patterns are what we're going to go on to describe in more detail in this module. In humans, it's been possible to observe different attachment patterns or strategies, as they're sometimes referred to. And there's been a lot of research on this that we can broadly notice three different attachment patterns, which we're going to go on to explain each of them in more detail. But it's important to emphasise here that we're simplifying something that in reality is much more complicated. So we're defining these three different patterns, but in reality it's possible to show mixtures of these patterns in different relationships in our lives or at different times. 
in our lives depending on what we're going through at any point interpersonally. But essentially, these patterns are observed when we have an experience of separation from our attachment figures. And you can observe these patterns in infants, which we'll go on to explain. So these patterns describe our reaction when we're triggered to seek out our attachment figure, either by a period of separation from them or in distress, discomfort or unease. So you observe how we deal with that separation from our attachment figure, but it's equally important to observe how we respond when we are reconciled with our attachment figure again. When we get back together again, how we're able to recover our sense of secure relationship. So essentially, these patterns of or different styles are a reflection of how secure or not we feel that people are going to be consistently there for us in a supportive way. So it's important to emphasize with you here that although these patterns do have an impact on the quality of our relationships and how mental health and well-being, it's quite common across society to have insecure attachment patterns or elements of that in our experience. So as I was saying, you can see the different attachment styles and strategies operating in infants from around 18 months. And you can test the predominant attachment strategy that's showing by observing how the child reacts when they're separated from the attachment person. Quite often this will be the mother, but it could be a father or grandparent, aunt, etc. So in the test situation, um, the mother leaves the room and, and leaving the child on their own in the presence of an unfamiliar person, a stranger. So their presence will activate the child's wish to seek their secure base. So in this test scenario, um, the situation being um, the child is being both sort of abandoned by one's attachment figure and being left alone with a complete stranger. So, so this triggers both the basic emotion of separation, anxiety and fear in most children. So one observes how the child deals um, with this situation, sort of how they react. But equally importantly, how they react when the mother returns to the room again after a short period of time. So in that test situation, a child who is displaying what we call a secure attachment, they react with unease and they protest um, to the signal that the mother is going to leave the room. So in the secure attachment strategy, it's normal to experience unease and distress from separation from the attachment figure. The securely attached child settles relatively quickly after the attachment figure, mother, has left the room and they start to play. And when the mother returns, they will go to the mother and they might sort of whinge and grumble for a bit because it's been distressing for them having that separation. And they, they might sit on the mother's lap but they, they reconnect relatively quickly after a short period of time, they'll start to play again. So this shows a sense of security that one's attached figure is going to return after the separation and a sense of confidence that they're going to be emotionally available to us, um, so receptive to us. And if we develop this attachment style relatively consistently, this does help us as adults to have more trusting relationships, sort of lasting relationships. We're able to tolerate separations in our relationships better. And we might tend to have slightly more, more of a sense of self-esteem. We might feel more comfortable sharing our feelings, those inner experiences with friends and partners. And we would naturally seek out support in times of need. 
So, so this is the secure attachment pattern. Now, some children have what's called an insecure attachment pattern. Um, and there are broadly two types of these. There's the ambivalent, or, or sometimes referred to as over-involved type. In this ambivalent or over-involved type, the child becomes insecure about their attachment person. And the likelihood is with, with good reason. Um, it's probably due to the attachment figure has been unpredictable in their availability to the child when they're distressed. And that, that might be unpredictable in their physical presence um, or in their emotional presence. But in order to attract their attachment person's attention, the child, we think in this attachment strategy, has learned to sort of exaggerate their emotional expression. So, for example, they express an excessive amount of unease or crying when their need for the attachment figure gets activated. So if we think about that test situation that we described previously, where, where we explain the child being abandoned, being left in the room when the attachment figure, usually the mother or caregiver, leaves the room and they tend to, they tend to cry loudly and they cling to their attachment figure, they don't want them to leave. Then when they have left the room, the child displaying this attachment strategy will have some difficulty in settling down and playing while the mother is away. And equally, when we observe how they respond when the mother returns, this is where um, what's called the ambivalent part of, of this strategy shows. Um, they have sort of, they're mixed about how they reconnect with the mother. So they might continue to cry and protest when the mother wants to pick them up and may even avoid being picked up. But they will gradually settle down. So they're a bit wary about whether their attachment figure is really here for them. So that's where the ambivalent bit comes in. They feel a sort of conflict inside. You know, I really want to connect to my attachment figure, the mother, but I'm not sure if she's permanently there for me. So they might have a sort of a push and pull with them. And this sort of push and pull with someone who has developed this type of strategy does seem to carry through into their adult relationships. Then it might result in someone being very wary about developing new relationships or getting close to others. And when they do, they might worry about whether their partner is really there for them. Or when there's a threat of separation or a relationship ending, they may become extremely distraught. We think this strategy comes from having learned that we can't fully trust that people will reliably be there for us in terms of their physical presence, but also in terms of how receptive they might be to us in our distress and our need for their support and help. And this leads to us trying to hold on tightly to people due to the fear that they will either leave us or stop caring for us. The other kind of insecure attachment pattern or strategy is what's known as the distanced or detached or avoidant. It's in many ways the opposite of the ambivalent pattern we've just described. So where the ambivalently attached child will have learned to exaggerate their emotional reactions, the distanced child exhibits little response, or it may not be visible that they are having a reaction to something. Um, so they're known, that's what's known as, as detached. So if we think about this in the test situation, the distance child um, doesn't appear to react at all to their attachment figure leaving the room in that test situation. It's as if on the surface, they don't care if the mother leaves or returns. So they may not respond to the mother leaving. They will just carry on playing with their toys. 
However, when children with this strategy or, or pattern are measured for their physical response to the situation, they exhibit a tremendous amount of distress, but it's not visible and not expressed in their behaviour. So the way in which they've been tested is by measuring a stress hormone called cortisone, um, which can be measured in saliva. So when they test the child during the, this test situation, during the separation from the attachment figure, the cortisol shows that high increase indicating high levels of distress. But as stated, this wouldn't be noticeable from their behaviour. So this comes back to that point we were making in previous slides about emotions, the reaction pattern. They don't become aware of the emotion, so we don't recognise it. So this more distant strategy, they've learnt in a sense to sort of over-regulate their, their feelings. And we think this may have been a response to perhaps you know, having experience of prolonged periods of neglect or having experience of the feelings commonly being overlooked or being misunderstood. Or in the worst scenarios, being given a very negative message during their distress and being ridiculed or in maybe even having been given a very negative experience of someone being angry with them for being upset. So they may have experienced some negative consequences to expressing their feelings. So to summarise, our attachment patterns or, or style is very much dependent on how our interactions with our early attachment figures develop. So the attachment patterns we display in our adulthood are formed largely by our early childhood experiences in our attachment relationships. And our attachment patterns as are as much to do with how we attract attention or how ready we are to call for or reach out for help when we're in distress. But what I would like to emphasise, and I don't want us to confuse this with the idea of attention seeking behaviour, as I don't think this is a useful way of thinking about things. This is about how we adapt to survive if we're not able to attract attention and to get our needs met in an ordinary way through signalling our distress. We might have found other ways of doing so. so. Survival mechanisms to get through life. And it's also important to emphasise that we're simplifying things here and breaking them down into the key sort of attachment patterns. In reality, our profile, as it were, for each of us is going to be much more mixed. So it is possible to have a mixture of insecure and secure attachment strategies or um, secure and insecure. And these can be activated at different times in different relationships. So the times in our adult experiences when these attachment patterns can get particularly activated is during times of separation and abandonment. So when we're frightened or unsettled in some way. And the other thing to say, the way we regulate our attachment relationships does have an influence on our lives. And that's why we think it's important to bring this to your attention. So you can start to think and consider the influence this has on key relationships in your life. So to help us develop our understanding of attachment patterns and strategies, we're going to look again at Layla and Michelle. And in this scenario, Layla's gone away for a week on a course and she wants to develop her career. And during the week she's away, Michelle sends her a number of messages. She doesn't reply to these until she's on the train on the way home. Now Michelle's messages range from sort of initially sort of suggesting she wrap up warm because of the weather forecast. 
to asking her what she might like for dinner when she returns. And on the final day, Michelle got really worried about the weather forecast and starts checking the weather obsessionally. On Layla's return, she asks Michelle how his week has been. And he replies by stating he had a fantastic week and very busy. He had loads to do and wished he had more time. So we'd like to invite you to, to think about that scenario in light of the attachment strategies we've just been thinking about together for both Michelle and Layla. So what in that information have we got that tells us about what their underlying attachment strategies might be? And finally, why do we think Michelle answers the way he does when Layla asks how his week has been? So these are some of the themes that have tended to come out of the discussions we have um, in previous groups. So people sort of highlight that Michelle seems to be displaying predominantly a sort of insecure and ambivalent or, or preoccupied attachment pattern. He seems to be really struggling with the separation and thinking about Layla all the time, thinking about whether she will be able to return safely. And he, he's thinking in his mind about them getting back together again. And people sometimes suggest that Michelle is being very clingy. And indeed, this is one of the markers of a more ambivalent attachment pattern, getting very preoccupied with the security of the relationship. There's often a question whether Layla is showing a sort of uh, an insecure and distanced pattern and that she's not having any reaction to the separation or whether she's just secure and not too phased by the separation. And one thing that might help us work that out is that she doesn't seem to be experiencing any kind of separation anxiety here which would be normal in a more secure attachment pattern. You, you would feel a degree of pain or a pang of missing someone, but she doesn't seem to be showing that at all. And we haven't, but we haven't given lots of information, so we're, we're, we're just sort of trying to sort of grapple with what we've got. But also when we think about um, Michelle's response when Layla returns, and about having, a, um, having had a fantastic busy week. This is perhaps another manifestation of his insecure ambivalent attachment pattern, whereby he per perhaps sort of feels a little wary and has mixed feelings about reconnecting. So he has to say, I've been fine here. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much I needed you all this time you were away. So, so that was the sort of, these are some of the reflections that we have in our group discussions. And I, I wonder uh, if they resonate with any of the thoughts you had. So just to sort of summarise what we've covered in this module, it's how attachment relates to how secure we feel about significant others in our lives and how they're going to be consistently there for us, either physically or emotionally in a receptive way. To, to what um, we need in our distress. And depending on how secure or not we feel in relation to that, we will have been influenced in how we deal with our own emotional needs and how much we call or reach out for help and support or not. And so we've developed different survival strategies based on our early experiences. But I'd really like to re-emphasise again, that whilst these patterns do have a significant impact on our adult relationships, they aren't fixed. And things are much more mixed in reality. And it is possible to develop more secure relationships in adulthood, which is very much the work of psychotherapy, helping us consider the quality of our relationships and how we can adapt the way we are in them to make them more fulfilling, more meaningful and secure for us. 
So given all that we have thought about throughout this module in regards to these attachment patterns and strategies, I'd like to invite you to think about the common attachments or strategies you might notice in yourself and how might it show in your relationships? 